everyone, and welcome to the Florida Mental Health Counselors Association webinar entitled Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Queer Youth, Family Acceptance and Emotional Development with Julie Basulto, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist. This is the eighth webinar for our 2019 Emerging Issues in Mental Health Counseling webinar series. My name is Aaron Norton. I'm the uh, president and uh, chair of FAMCA's Education, Training Standards, and Continuing Education Committee, and I'm going to be your moderator today. And now I'm going to, uh, before we get into our presenter, um, I'm going to launch a couple polling questions. The first polling question should now be on your screen. The question is, which of the following describes you? Select all that apply. Um, so you can select more than one option. Your first option is licensed mental health professional. Second option is registered intern, counseling student, counselor educator, or you can select other. And I'll go ahead and close this polling question out and share our results. 80% of you are licensed professionals, 7% are registered interns, 13% are students, and then 7% are other. So I'll launch a second polling question um, and final one. Which of the following learning objectives are you most interested in hearing about today? There are three options. Number one, learn about the impact of sexual identity disclosure. Two, explore benefits to providing support to LGBT youth. And third, identify treatment approach, approaches and resources for LGBT youth. 63% of you are interested in identifying treatment approaches and resources for LGBT youth. 31% interested in learning about the impact of sexual identity disclosure. And then finally, 6% of you said explore the benefits to providing support to LGBT youth. All right, so now that we've gotten a sense of who's out in the audience today, I'm going to go ahead and introduce today's presenter. Julie Basulto is a licensed marriage and family therapist, licensed in the state of Florida since 2008. Ms. Basulto is a qualified supervisor for the state of Florida and supervising registered marriage and family therapy interns and registered mental health counseling interns since 2010. Ms. Basulto currently supervises graduate students for their practicum and internship from various universities. She attained her master's degree in marriage and family therapy in 2005 from St. Thomas University and has extensive experience in working with children and adolescents with severe behavioral and emotional problems, including LGBTQ youth. Ms. Basulto has provided services in the home, outpatient, and in private practice. She's a former clinical supervisor and is currently a senior therapist at Christie House, which is a child advocacy center providing individual, family, and group counseling for child, adolescent, and adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Ms. Basulto conducts community and outreach presentations in the community and advocating for the victims of child sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, and the LGBTQ community. Ms. Basulto received her national certification as a trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapist in 2013 and is currently certified in training consultants and other mental health professionals on TFCBT. She is a clinical fellow for the American Association of Marriage and Family Therapy and holds memberships at the American Counseling Association as well as the American Psychological Association. In addition to Ms. Basulto's clinical experience, she teaches counseling and psychology courses in colleges and universities in South Florida. She's in current pursuit of a PhD in counseling education at Barry University, where she hopes to continue research and advocacy work with traumatized youth and pursue a career in teaching future counselors. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Julie Basulto. Thank you so much, Aaron, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it is, um, I, I appreciate the opportunity in presenting on, on this topic today uh, for the audience. Um, like Aaron mentioned, um, I have several years experience uh, in working with this population and I hope to be able to educate uh, the audience and, and give insight on uh, issues that are important in this particular section of the LGBT community and, and finding better ways on, uh, on working with these families. Uh, the LGBT youth is a, a vulnerable population and that's uh, underserved at times and um, counseling professionals need to be uh, informed and in how to better able to work uh, with the youth and their fa and, and the families that uh, that uh, that they're with um, as the coming out process is something that can be very traumatic for for a lot of LGBT youth um, so uh, 
uh, now that, you know, before we begin, I want to show some images of, of recent events that, that occurred. It's, it's, um, the most recent event, at least for the LGBT community, was uh, the Pulse shooting that happened back in June of 2016. Um, so a lot of times when I present um, in this particular topic, um, I ask the audience as to um, what are you know what are some initial reactions and emotions that um, that they you know uh, they you know they have when when seeing these images in uh, TV and the media. Um, most say, "Well, you know, I feel you know I feel sad. I feel hopeless. I, I feel scared for for my child." Um, you know, a lot of a, a barrage of emotions just you know come into play when seeing these images. But then from the opposite end, um, a lot of times you know people will say, "Well, you know." They see hope, they see unity, uh, they see resilience. So, so despite you know these images at times being horrific, it can be you know it can be very um, hopeful for 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 others. But you know at the same time, you know we see all this in the media. We see all all, all these things happening in in today's society, and. You know, I, I asked the question to the audience, what kind of message does this give to our children? So for those that are in the audience, um, please feel free to type in, um, you know, things that come to mind when, when these images come to play. And what kind of message does it give to our children seeing, being exposed to all of this when it comes to, you know, their, their identity formation? So with that said, I mean, take your time. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll have access to see the answers on the, on, on the screen. Um, but it, these are things to think about because um, at the end of the day, you know, whatever we expose our children to does have an impact at some level. So when it comes time um, to, you know, of adolescents where they're, they're thinking about their sexual identity, their gender identity, um, if, if, if youth see that, um, they're receiving all these negative messages back and forth. Um, it can it can cause a lot of confusion, a lot of secrecy, um, you know, uh, avoidance and having to deal with the with the problem um, and, and feeling comfortable and being able to express themselves uh, how they wish to express themselves themselves. So <clears throat> so part of what we're going to be talking about today is we're going to be, you know, educating um, uh, the public are specifically in the in this type of setting counseling professionals about LGBT youth and the impact of disclosure of their sexual and or gender identity, as well as the consequences on the lack of emotional support from caregivers. We're also going to learn about um, the benefits in, in providing support and acceptance um, to LGBT youth, including uh, research evidence and how caregivers can assist in, in a youth's coming out process. Now, in this objective, in this webinar today, I'm going to um, share with you some findings I, I had with a research study that I did um, uh, during my e um, PhD program where I interviewed um, several caregivers on their experiences about their youth coming out um, to them and how what their initial reactions were like, how they're dealing with it today, how they've been seeking support. So, so part of our presentation is going to be talking about, you know, not just what what is what the research is out there, but what I was uh, as a researcher myself, I was able to um, get from it. And then finally, we're going to uh, talk about treatment approaches and resources to assist um, LGBTQ youth and, and their families. So the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, uh, the adolescent development. So, um, you know, in this stage of development, adolescents who may not experience issues with um, the gender or sexual identity, they go through um, various phases in that in, in their development. Um, there's first the physical development, which can 
can sue from, you know, the, the physical growth and hormone changes in their body, um, you know, their, you know, issues with body image, um, you know, being able, uh, you know, they tend to at times compare themselves to peers. Um, and, and, and also, you know, their, you know, their physical, uh, physiological responses to sexual desire and so forth. Right. And the same at the same time, you know, the cycle of social aspects of, of adolescent development, you know, is about being able to find out who they are. Right. And what their contribution, their contribution is to the world around them. And, and they, you know, they want they have a sense of independence. They want to be, um, you know, less dependent on their on their parents and, you know, make their own decisions and so forth. And also, uh, you know, you know, being able to, you know, question others, question authority. Uh, you know, at this point in, in 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 one's human development, they're able to, you know, have have their own opinions on things, people, situations, and so forth. And then you have the cognitive part of an adolescent's development. The, you know, being able to think abstractly, being able to find the ability to reason, uh, consider, you know, multiple possibilities. And, you know, but at the same time, cognitively, since their brains are not fully formed, they, you know, they tend to be very impulsive and, and, and make decisions without thinking the long-term consequences at the end. Um, you know, they have that sense of invisibility, invisibility, you know, which, you know, it can happen to me, you know, I can do anything, you know, which, you know, can contribute to, to risky, you know, risky behaviors and so forth. Um, so, so at the end of the day, uh, you know, they, you know, an adolescent that's not experiencing any type of sexual identity issues, you know, is dealing with all of these changes uh, in their development. And but then now you add in the, the the factor of, okay, you know, I think I may be gay or I think I may be um, a lesbian, but. Uh, I don't know how my parents are going to deal with it. I don't know how my friends are going to react. And, and so you, they tackle that into play, then it becomes, the problems for them become more amplified. Okay. So then we, you know, we go with what, okay, what is LGBTQ, right? So somebody, uh, persons including youth, uh, ident who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning um, as to their sexual, ident uh, sexual identity and, and or um, gender identity. Now there's two, there's two differences between sexual identity and gender identity. So sexual identity is how one thinks of oneself in terms of who so the person is e either emotionally, romantically, or sexually attracted to. OK, and then there's gender identity, where it's the person's internal and, and personal uh, a sense of being a man or a woman or somebody outside of the gender binary. So a lot of times, um, especially, you know, when working with families uh, or, you know, people in general, they they tend to get both both um, um, mixed or intertwined. Uh, yeah, so somebody who may be. Uh, identifying as transgender may, you know, their sexual identity may be heterosexual, or they may be transgender and they may identify as homosexual or bisexual and so forth. Okay, so it's very important to be able to distinguish the difference between the two. Okay, and um, I, I'm going to stop here for a moment. Does, um, are there any questions from, from the audience that, um, that I can answer at this time? So I can tell you uh, there were several different uh, comments that were entered when you were showing the pictures and then afterwards when you asked about um, feelings that people will experience when they see these pictures. And some of the things that people said were, it's not safe, fear, it can be confusing and a bit alarming. It sends the message that it's not okay to be gay or trans. And uh, I see hope in the pictures that you shared hope for people to come together and support each other through tragedies that they've experienced. Yes, I agree. I mean, those are all very common um, responses to when they see these pictures. Um, so yes, I appreciate your feedback. Um, uh, are, were there, are there any other questions from the audience 
Other yes, than there is there is one question so far. Um, and Denny has asked, double checking queer, could you review this definition? Yes, uh, someone who identifies as queer uh, may, may be uh, in the process of be able uh, to explore who they are sex, uh, as far as their sexuality and, and their gender identity. Uh, they may not conform to the societal norms of what is being you know, straight or, or, or gay or being a man or a woman. So somebody who identifies as queer, it's the umbrella term for um, within the LGBTQ spectrum as, okay, this is who they, they identify. Um, you know, some may already be more, you know, confident as far as how they identify. So, but if they're in the process of coming out, then um, they, may, they may identify as queer at, at this time. Any All other? right. Yeah. That is it for the questions for now. Okay, thank you. So we talked about adolescent uh, development in the course of, of, of human development. And uh, as far as I, uh, uh, identity development when it comes to identify uh, identifying as LGBTQ, um, one of the uh, first researchers uh, when it came to the uh, identity development, when it came to this um, this sector of the population, was Vivian Cass. Um, she she explored the process of identity formation when it came to um, somebody who identified as as gay or lesbian, and and they and she described it in in, in a process of six, of six stages that the individual may go through. Now, it, this is something very important to keep in mind that, it, you know, not all may go through these stages when it comes to their identity development. Um, and it, it, it may, it can be due to various factors. Um, you know, they may live um, their whole lives living in a heteronormative uh, society and, and so forth and may not come out till midlife. So those are things that are very important to keep in mind um, when thinking about um, the homosexual model of identity development. Now, she, uh, she talked about six stages where the first stage that the individual goes through is identity formation. So, you know, they come to realize that they are attracted to the same sex, right? So they may be going through that process of like, do I, do I like girls? Do I like boys? Um, you know, what is what does this say about me? So they may they may go through this through this stage, you know, for for several years before they they may they can move on to the next stage of identity comparison. So by this by this stage, they they come to terms with the possibility of being homosexual or or lesbian. That they're you know they're thinking about okay they've they feel consistent that they are attracted to the same sex. Um, so that may go on for a while until they're, they're able to transition to identity tolerance, which is the, the increased commitment to being homosexuals. This is when they start feeling more confident in, 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 in knowing that they are, they are indeed gay, right? Then by then, then they may they may transition into identity acceptance, which is the increased contact with other homosexuals as a normalized way of life. Um, so, you know, they may now's when they may start meeting other people in the community. Uh, they may, you know, they may, you know, participate in in um, you know a, a clubs, organizations catered to the LGBT. Uh, population. Um, if if you're gay youth, you may uh, you may join the GSA Alliance at, at school or or um, uh, or other or other organizations in the community. Okay. Um, then they may move on. You know, for a while they may move on to identity pride, which the, the, by this point the individual fully accepts themselves. Um, uh, as far as their 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 identity, as far as their sexual identity, and and they're more they become more self aware. They become more aware of the homo negativity in the society brings about uh, when one identifies uh, as as being LGBT. Okay, and that may take some time before they become more active in the community um, and so forth. And then by then, the last stage that she talks about is identity synthesis, which is 
you know, the, the individual, uh, they, they accept society's norms and is able to introduce themselves with heterosexuals who are accepting and supportive of their identity. So like I said, like I mentioned earlier, it does take time uh, for somebody to be able to fully develop uh, their sense of, of sexual identity. Uh, now, keeping in mind for those that never come out um, for those, or for those that may come out later in life, the process uh, may, may serve as a challenge for them uh, because they lived their life a certain way and now they're, you know, they're moving forward um, and, uh, with this identity. So now going back to our youth, okay, so LGBT uh, research has talked about that LGBTQ youth that uh, experience a variety of struggles when coming out to their families. Um, a lot of times they may experience a lack of acceptance and support. Uh, they may experience a sense of isolation. They, they can't really talk to anyone about what's, what's happening to them, uh, what's going on, uh, which the isolation can lead to depression. And then with depression, um, you know, they may engage in, you know, risky behaviors such as um, drug or alcohol abuse or other types of, of risky behaviors uh, related to their sexual health. And then um, with most, they may, they, they're, they are vulnerable to, um, to risk of suicide. Um, I, again, when there's a lack of acceptance and support from those uh, around them, then uh, then the chances may increase uh, of that, them attempting to um, to to harm themselves or thinking that a suicide is is the way out. Um, and then also another a big a risk factor involved when you know when they do come out is uh, the risk of 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 being of being abused, whether it's physical, any type of physical abuse or emotional abuse or, or sexual abuse. Uh, in my experience in working with youth, it's, you know, a lot of times, um, you know, they, you know, they've been able to, you know, they feel confused about, you know, their sexuality, you know, because sexual abuse has taken place. And, and a lot of the work with them is helping them understand that, their sexual identity or gender identity has nothing to do with um, um, with with their sex uh, with being abused, being sexually abused, and it's and abuse is you know if, for those that that um, have experience in working with trauma, um, a lot of uh, a lot of it is the victim blaming, the self blame, and and so forth. So it's it's really helping them understand that those two things are separate. And especially with caregivers, caregivers may come in, um, you know, struggling, you know, with their child's disclosure and, and asking questions. Well, does, you know, does, um, you know, does my child's sexuality have to do anything with them getting sexually abused? And, and a lot of work has, you know, is done with them as far as educating them on that, but, you know, being able to separate the two. Um, and, and being able to address the trauma in order for them to be able to live a, a, a better quality of life after. So are there any, any other questions so far? Um, right now, I do not see any um, additional questions. Okay. Uh, there's a thank you for answering the last question. Oh. You're welcome. Okay, so in, during the course of this presentation, um, I will be always doing a sidebar when it comes to um, to trans youth, because um, because they are um, they are a highly vulnerable um, population within the LGBT community. Uh, what you know, what may work with LGBT uh, uh, youth may not work out the same way with trans with trans youth and and I know there's been a lot of recent um, advocacy uh, with the transgender population it's it's been more um, it's, they've been more vocal and as far as like services for them and especially you know with today's uh, political climate there's there's always been there's always been you know um, a lot of controversial um, issues when it comes um, to the trans um, population. So um, 
going to trans to the trans youth, um, again, we see these images, right? So, you know, when I um, when I ask the audience, uh, you know, what do they think of when they see these images? I mean, um, normally I get responses like they seem happy, they seem cheerful, um, they seem like they have it put together. Um, but in reality, you know, uh, un it's unfortunate, but the youth you see here have all died by suicide. And again, with with the uh, with the transgender population, it's it, they're they're hot, they're highly vulnerable, and 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 at higher risk of of uh, discrimination, prejudice, um, targeted for um, crimes, uh, particularly um, crimes related to domestic abuse and so forth. So, and and all the and all these teens here that you see on the screen, they all um, they they're all identi they all identified as as trans, and and the reason why they thought that you know, dying by suicide was, felt that that was their only way out is because the primary reason was they, they just they didn't feel accepted or supported by their families. So again, put this out there, what type, what kinds of messages does that give our children when they see these things happen? And again, it's up to you, uh, the audience, if you want to answer, um, please feel free to type in, um, but it's, it's, you know, Think about it, and and later on we'll we'll go back. So some facts uh, when it comes to um, the trans population, uh, there are four times as likely to live in poverty. Um, they vast uh, vast majority experience uh, unemployment four times as twice the general population, particularly uh, persons of color and up to four times the national unemployment rate, okay? Uh, research has uh, reported that 90% report re experiencing harassment, mistreatment, uh, mistreatment, and discrimination on, the, on their jobs. 22% um, have reported harassment by law enforcement uh, and at much higher rates uh, with persons of color. 46% reported feeling uncomfortable seeking police assistance. And that may be due to um, past experiences that, that they have. Um, most alarming for me uh, is 41% have attempted um, to die by suicide. And, and that's the part that, that really rings true to me as far as working uh, with, with trans youth. Um, they're at higher, higher risk of, of, of suicide than, than, than in the, um, with other LGB uh, youth. And also 50% of transgender youth will have at least one suicide attempt before their 20th birthday, which again is pretty scary. So to be a parent of, of, of a youth that it, it, um, identifies as trans, it's, it, it screams out to me the importance of, of, of nurturing our children and, and, and keeping them safe from harm. So home, family is where they should feel the most safe in. And if they don't feel safe in their home because they can express themselves for who they truly are, it can be very um, alarming, especially for you know, professionals and other uh, medical professionals working with this sector of the LGBT uh, population. And up until now, um, this has gone back and forth uh, at this point. Um, they're, not able to serve in the military. And if anyone in the audience knows of any uh, recent changes, please feel free to type in your responses. So before I go on, were there any responses from the previous slide? Okay, so we do have some responses, um, the, uh, and a, as well as a question. Some of the responses were, the parents' love is conditional, that they are not able to tell their families and have to hide their true identity. They have to live a life alone and without acceptance from anyone, even the family that should support them. Mm -hmm. Another response was the word despair. Yes. Um, another one, the message that is sent to transgender is that they cannot really be who they are. Um, and then we have... Um, 
there, there's also the comment, how do you navigate the hormonal desires of the youth or the ho hormone desires of the youth and when parents are against paying for it? Well, that might be a question, actually. That's, yeah, it sounds like that's a question. Um, really, at, at that point, um, when it comes to working with trans youth and decision decision making regarding hormone therapy, uh, gender reassignment surgery and all that, um, I think, I mean, that's something that it's up to the discretion of the parents and the youth to, to be able to decide and talk about. Um, I, you know, that's not something that should be pushed until the the youth is 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 able to make those types of decisions as they get older. So it's it's uh, um, part of it is is being able to um, be supportive in the sense of um, you know allowing the youth to be able to express themselves. Um, you know, as far as their identity is concerned, their gender identity is concerned, I'd be able to dress um, fit for the, with the gender that, uh, that they identify with um, and so forth. So at that time, I wouldn't be able to even like, you know, as parents not even approach that um, until they're old enough to, you know, talk, have those conversations and, and start making some of those decisions. Uh, there is a new story uh, that um, NBC, NBC um, broadcasted a few years ago about um, about transgender children. And there was this one child in particular that the family was interviewed, the child was interviewed. I think he um, was uh, five years old at the time and he was born female and from a very, very early age and, and their toddler years, um, he started identifying as a boy. And, and one thing that the, the news story really highlighted with one of the doctors that was interviewed was, if there's consistence, persistence, and insistence, that's when you need to, you know, as parents start need to further explore um, what, what, their, what the next steps should be. Um, because by the age of three, as far as um, uh, human development, by, between the ages of three and five years old, children are able to identify uh, with with their gender. So that's something that's going to be important to keep in mind. So if, if if parents start noticing those types of patterns, then it's, you know, be able to, for them to be able to seek the, the assistance that they need to be able to um, provide that emotional support to their child. All right, we do have a couple other questions as well, a few actually. Okay. Um, another question is from Sally who asks, do you see many comorbid diagnoses of eating disorders along with transgender youth? Um, not in my practice. Um, uh, there is, I mean, a, a lot of uh, some of the trans youth that I've worked with, they they tend to experience body image issues, um, but it's really because of, you know, the biological gender that they were born with. Um, but as far as eating disorders, um, I haven't seen the correlation yet in my practice. All right. And another question is from Robert who asks, in a treatment setting where supervised urine testing is required, how does a program deal with transgendered persons? Uh, I'm assuming he might also specifically be referring to how oftentimes in, in those environments, they will have a staff member of the same biological sex as the client. Um, observe the urine testing. Okay, um, yeah, that sounds like it would be um, in, in a substance abuse treatment setting or a residential treatment setting. Um, I mean, I, I don't have extensive knowledge of that, um, but I do know, um, since I do work in an outpatient setting, um, you, know, as, you know, as far as like use of bathrooms, facilities, and so forth, uh, we do have a bathroom that's designated, you know, as a family bathroom, and uh, and the youth can can go in there and use the facilities. Um, but as far as drug testing is concerned, um, I, I I wouldn't be able to answer that for you. <laughs> All right, and then we have one more question from Roxana, who asks, "What do you recommend when the parents do not allow youth to express their gender identity?" Oh, good question. I think I'll. I'll um, uh, that's that's where the real work comes in, and um, it's about um, helping families and caregivers get to a place where um, they're at least accepting of their of their youth's um, 
uh, gender expression. So I, I worked with one family in the last couple of years where um, uh, the youth identified as gay, but he was very um, expressive in, in, in how he expressed you know, himself. Um, he had long nails, he, he wore um, eyeliner, he was very meticular in his appearance and um, they just, yeah, dad, stepmom had a really hard time with that and, and would not allow him to express himself that way. But then when he would um, stay with mom, that had, they had joint custody, then, you know, she was uh, you know, more supportive of his, of his um, expression uh, and, and would allow him to be himself. So it, 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 takes, it takes time and effort. So um, it's getting to a place where, um, the, you know, they're educated as far as like, okay, what are the long-term consequences? Do you prefer your child to be depressed and, and all the time? Or do you want your child um, to be happy and be like, okay, this is how they're going to be happy. They're going to be happy if they express themselves this way. So I hope that answers your question. All right, and there are no further questions at this time. All right, thank you. Okay, so um, recent or uh, older studies by by leading researchers in the LGBT um, population have have indicated that um, you know in their studies by Grossman and Diangeli uh, that forty five percent of uh, of transgender youth seriously thought about taking their own lives. So in this particular study that they did, they they interviewed um, trans youth and, and, and as far as like, um, you know, as far, as far as their findings are concerned, it was very alarming um, that at least 45% thought about um, taking their own lives. And, and out of that, 26% reported a history of life threatening behaviors, such as a suicide attempt. And what I found most alarming uh, was that out of the five, 55% participants in the study, only 10 discuss their suicidal lethality to, to their counselors or other helping professionals, which to me, it, it can say um, a lot about, okay, could it be, you know, could it be a systemic issue? Could it be an issue within the profession? Um, are, are professionals asking um, those, those questions that matter? Are, uh, how are they, you know, assessing for, um, as far as like uh, suicidal lethality and intent and plan and so forth. So a question that I would like to pose to the audience and I'll, you know, uh, I'll go back and, and see what the responses are, but what are some, um, what are some reasons why possibly youth may, may hold back on um, talking about their depression and those thoughts of, of, of self-harm, especially when it comes to trans youth? So, and I'll go back in a couple of minutes for that. Okay. So research has found that family accept, uh, acceptance by family has had a positive impact on the process of the youth self-acceptance. So if my family uh, is okay with me being gay that, or bi, that I, you know, that I'm going to feel more confident about myself. Okay. Um, yeah as well as youth will feel more, uh, more secure and self-confident in their sexual identity and they'll express it. And, a la and the research has shown that a lack of family acceptance may create difficulties in the youth's sexual identity development. So if there's a backlash, if there's uh, you know, negative messages being given to them about um, not, you know, it's not okay to be gay, it's not okay to be lesbian, it's not okay to be trans, then that's going to hold them back as far as their development is concerned. It's going to be compromised. So, and with that, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in a similar study, not all LGBT uh, youth experience the same aspects of identity formation the same way at the same time. And some state that some uh, areas may not be experienced at all. So, you know, going back to Cass's um, uh, six stages of, of homosexual identity development, um, it, you know, research has confirmed that, you know, it may not, youth, some youth may not go through it at the same time or may go through it at different times in their life. 
okay? And in this one study, um, 169 LGBT uh, adolescents and young adults between the ages of 14 to 24 indicated that parental support was important in their development and as many reported moderate levels um, of, of parental rejection and internalized homo negativity. So, you know, they do want to be accepted and supported by their families. So it's just, again, another evidence that it is that being accepted and supported by their families and, and other caregivers is, is very important for them to be able to grow into healthy um, individuals. Um, any responses from the previous question or? Yes, we do have uh, several responses. Okay. Um, they are probably the most serious youth about carrying through and don't want their counselor to interrupt their suicidal plan. That sure. was one response. Yes. Second one, they do not trust anyone because of the stigma they have experienced in the past. Definitely. Another comment, feeling alienated. They don't want to feel different. Fear. Um, yeah. Another, I think they may be afraid to express thoughts of suicide because of fear of being hospitalized. Not yes. only just because it's the hospital, but many hospitals struggle with making transgender people feel heard of supported, including calling them by their dead name or using inappropriate pronouns. Yes. Fear that people will blame a mental illness on being transgender. Many people believe youth are confused in their identity. Mm -hmm. Issues of trust with the therapist, uncertainty of response. Some reasons they may hold back on talking about suicidality or self-harm is that they do not trust the person they're talking to or they're concerned that their parent will not or will be told and they will get into trouble. And then the final comment uh, is, uh, it looks like it's a clarification of the therapist, okay, from a previous comment, so never mind. Okay. And that is it. Yeah, those are all, those are all um, ring true. I mean, a lot of times um, uh, youth are pretty, they're pretty, you know, vigilant about who they disclose to. So if they see that the mental health professional is kind of skittish or apprehensive about, you know, about the topic of gender and sexuality, they, they you know, first they may not come up to it, so they may not trust them, you know, to even, even be able to tell them, yeah, I am gay, but, you know, I, I'm feeling rejected and I'm so depressed that I want to hurt myself or I've had thoughts of hurting myself. So a lot of that is, you know, past experiences with mental health professionals, um, you know, having certain feelings and opinions about about gender and sexuality and so forth. And and yes, also, um, you know, uh, being the fear of being hospitalized is, I think it, it just runs the whole gamut, not just with um, the LGBT youth population, but all and you know, no one wants to be hospitalized. So, um, but yeah, I mean. And, and some, you know, depending where you're at in, in your profession, in your training, in your practice, um, you know, some people really tend to, you know, jump the gun or, 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 or be fearful of asking those questions. Uh, some, some therapists do have, have that anxiety, <laughs> that fear about, you know, well, if I ask, and, you know, if I don't ask, then everything's okay. So it's very, very important to ask the, the hard questions and, and feel confident, you know, having, having the confidence to ask those questions. So, um, but thank you. Thank you for those responses. So I'm going to talk about youth and cult um, cultural issues because uh, cultural issues come into play when it comes to uh, a youth disclosure process. Um, and then I'm going to be talking about the, the research that, that I did. Um, and a lot of times um, youth um, may, may feel rejected or be rejected um, because of, you know, religious reasons or other cultural reasons, uh, issues that come into play when it comes to the coming out process. So, um, so recent research um, done by Ryan Russell, Hubert Diaz, and Sanchez indicated that uh, white LGBT youth experience higher levels of family uh, acceptance when during their coming out process. Um, and they also found that immigrant families, particularly Latino families, is linked is linked with the lack of family acceptance. 
um, and, and, and also um, religious affiliation has a direct impact on family acceptance or lack thereof. Um, and it, they also found that higher parental occupational status equated with family acceptance. Um, and I mean, another uh, question that I want to throw out there and, and take your time in, in responding, but uh, possible reasons why um, uh, minority cultures may have a harder time or, or, or cultures that rely um, their, uh, the religion and faith um, as far as like emotional support and guidance and so forth. Why would they have a hard time, um, you know, with acceptance and support when it, com it comes to their, to their youth uh, coming out or expressing their gender or sexual identity? So, so again, I'll go back to that question and, and move forward. Um, so about a year and a half ago, I, I conducted a research study on, on interviewing um, caregivers um, whose youth had, um, had, had come out to them you know, as LGBT. And, um, and it was really interesting um, to see what, um, you know, what, how the research came, came about because this has been a, a, an area of interest for me for many years. And I really felt, and being a parent myself, uh, I really felt the need to be able to advocate for, uh, for this particular sector of the population. So, you know, in, in, in um, starting the PhD program, that was like, you know, the bulk of my research has been, okay, how can I help youth? And how, how can I help LGBT youth? And how can I help them, you know, when LGBT youth is, you know, is, is tra uh, they're traumatized either physically or sexually or, or, they, or they're neglected. So the purpose of, of my study was to give a voice to the caregiver's experiences and possible adjustment issues pertaining to their child's coming out process. Um, I explored how their initial reactions to uh, their, dis their child's disclosure um, as well as past and, and present support system for the caregiver and, and ways in which the caregiver is providing, is currently providing to uh, support to their child at this time. Um, so the, uh, the part participants in the study were parents and caregivers that were responsible for, uh, for the child rearing of youth who identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. So in, in the course of my research, uh, one, the, you know, the question that led me to really be able to investigate this is how do parents and other caregivers of LGBT youth um, uh, identify their experiences regarding their child's um, coming out process, right? So, you know, the way that I went about it as far as finding participants, um, I, I emailed recruitment flyers to listservs, community mental health agencies, and outreach programs. I used um, social media as a forum to um, recruit participants, also word of mouth. Uh, and then I conducted face-to-face -face interviews, um, you know, and I, I accommodated to their needs. Um, if they were out of the area of where I was living at, I would either go to them or we would do uh, do the interviews through Skype or FaceTime. And it was conducted. It was an open-ended interview. And out of that, I had seven uh, participants that uh, that uh, took their time to to meet with me. Um, they were all Caucasian women. Uh, they were all professionals in their community in their communities and they all identified as mothers of youth um, uh, of youth or young adults that identified as LGBT and out of the seven mothers six identified as biological parents and one identified as an adoptive parent and then then you'll see the breakdown uh, of the youth that that um, they were they were responsible for um, So uh, pretty much, you know, findings um, that that I had, um, you know, when when doing these interviews, when sifting through, you know, uh, recordings and so forth. Um, most of my findings, uh, you know, they've supported the previous research on on the topic. 
um, you know, parents who are supportive of their child's sexual gender identity are able to develop and maintain healthier relationships with their children. Um, they, the child was able to better um, develop a sense of self in their relationships and in their, in their identity development. Um, other findings, uh, the, ch the child is able to grow into an adult who be able to advocate for themselves and others within the LGBT community. And most of these caregivers are all, they're all active in some way in their, in, uh, in, in their communities or uh, within the LGBT communities. And most of these caregivers have been advocates for their child within their families and other systems. So um, they were really, really active in, in with their child and, and their, in their child's life from the get go. And when their child, you know, their child felt safe enough and, and comfortable to be able to come out when they were ready to come out. And in my findings, two of the caregivers that were interviewed reported experiencing difficulties and or adjustment issues regarding their child's gender identity, even when expressing support to their child. So, so going back to my previous question, um, are there any responses or? Yes, we do have some responses. First, um, Sally says the family is, the families have a harder time because they're trying to assimilate into the area that they've migrated to and do not want their children to stand out more or cause issues with assimilation. Yes. Um, Robert says minority populations feel marginalized already. Having mm -hmm. a child that is LGBTQ would further marginalize the family. Thomas had strong beliefs and following church teachings preclude members from questioning what is often misinterpretation of the Bible, Quran, Talmud, Blind faith can contribute to homophobia and intolerance towards LGBTQ and lack of acceptance when parents learn a child does not have the sexual or gender identity that the parents expected. Mm -hmm. And then um, Roxana asks a question. Um, why did you focus on Caucasian women? That question is separate from the previous uh, item. Yes, yeah, and, I, and I'll, I'll definitely answer that. Um, uh, from as far as previous responses, yes, when there's a stronghold when it comes to religion and faith, there is, I, it's, it's going against something that it's been ingrained with them since childhood. So it is, it becomes more, more challenging for, for families of, of, you know, that are faith-based to really be able to even come to terms with uh, with their child identifying a certain way that's uh, a, not of the quote unquote norm. Um, so, so definitely I, I agree with that. And also, yes, you know, marginalized communities, they're already, you know, going through enough and then now to have to deal with uh, their youth that identifies as, as a sexual gender minority can be even more impactful for them. So, and then going back to the question, yeah, why Caucasian women were interviewed, those were the responses that I got. Um, yes, I, I had um, I had one one parent uh, who identified as African American um, respond back to me and and um, wanting to talk about her experiences with um, with their youths uh, coming out, um, and I actively tried to engage her and reach out to her, but I never heard back from her. So it really, you know, um, made me see, okay, uh, that there may be um, some, you know, uh, issues there as far as like the previous research that, you know, why, why families tend to be more accepting. So, um, but yes, yes, I did. I really did want to reach out to, um, minority parents, but they, they just didn't, didn't respond to my, to my requests. So any other questions or feedback? Um, we do have one, um, a comment. Um, I found Asian mothers to be a lot more rigid with acceptance. Okay. Yeah. And that is it for okay. now. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so some of the responses from the caregivers, um, um, just want to read one out, uh, a few, a couple of these out to you. Um, uh, so one parent said, I ended up find, uh, um, 
founding our city's PFLAG chapter, I live in a pretty rural area and it's pretty conservative and there are very little resources for the LGBTQ community. That's one thing that has changed about me is that I'm hyper aware of the experiences of LGBTQ people as I am not LGBTQ. And then another parent said, um, I am the, uh, I'm the sexual health coordinator at said institution. And one of the things I'm heavily involved in is the, in the organization of Pride at our campus. And then, and then um, these responses um, came from the parents that their youth identified as trans. And um, one parent um, said, I think to be honest, I was more shook up about the, gender, the transgender issue than her being gay. Uh, I, I had a lot of concerns about that because it just, it, I don't know. I mean, I just felt a little sad about her not being my daughter anymore. So again, that's, you know, it could be an indicator of difficulties with, you know, a lot of parents tend to be, you know, open about, maybe open about their child being, you know, LGB, but then with the transgender issue like that, the anxiety may come up for them. It's, it's, um, it's a, another, another adjustment process at, at a different level at that point. And then uh, another parent said, I still struggle with it. I'm a devout Catholic and I still find myself thinking he is endangering his immortal soul, but there comes a point that you have to love your kid, whoever they are. I think I have to come to the point whether I'm accepting of the fact that this is, uh, this is, and this is not my decision. I love him. So, so it, it, again, I mean, my research, um, really pretty much uh, echoed what, um, what I had, um, what uh, the work of the, of the work that I was doing. So uh, I know there was the question, you know, why Caucasian women? And then this is what, this was one of the limitations to, to this study. Um, there was a lack of uh, racial ethnic diversity of the participants. There was a lack of diversity of uh, socioeconomic diversity of uh, participants. Uh, there was no male care caregivers that were interviewed. That would have been something that would have been nice to have interviewed a male care caregiver. Um, uh, difficulties in, in, in engaging South Florida community support groups to promote research study and, and its, uh, to its constituents. Uh, a lot of the, the community agencies that, that I reached out to, they were, you know, they would say, oh yeah, we'll hand out the flyer. Or, you know, oh, I would ask, can I come into um, your group and just introduce myself and talk and talk about the study and hand out flyers, but you know, due to la confidentiality confidentiality issues and all that, they they wouldn't allow me to go in and speak. Um, and finally, um, six of the participants have been uh, uh, have been outside of the state of South Florida and the eastern parts of the of the of the United States. So I would have liked to have a mo more diverse group of participants. And and even with, you know, a, a qualitative study of this nature, just, you know, having, you know, a little bit more diversity, like even if I had interviewed 10 people, it would have been nice to have, you know, have had more diversity and and those that responded. So Okay, so now we're going to talk about consequences to lack of support and acceptance. Okay, we've talked about, um, you know, uh, symptoms, behaviors, things that happen, the backlash, the uh, discrimination factor, and, and so forth. Uh, you know, uh, adolescents, uh, particularly LGBT youth, uh, adolescent development taking play and all that. Now we talk about, okay, so they, uh, um, the youth comes out. They get they get rejected for whatever reasons, like what we talked about. Okay, what happens? So research has shown that um, there is an increase in um, symptoms of depression when when uh, when youth feel feel um, not supported or rejected. Um, they they engage in risk taking behaviors, particularly drug and alcohol use. Um, they may, other risk taking behaviors that they may engage in, they may engage in truancy or may run away from home. Um, caregivers may be less protective of their youth. There's an increased risk of suicide and an increased risk of child abuse. Like, and also, um, you know, a parent's uh, religious belief may be a, a barrier to even disclosing at all.
So now what can what can parents and caregivers do, right? So um, one of the things that I always talk about, you know, when I do these presentations is, is really be able to help um, uh, professionals be able to educate their parents and, and, and caregivers of youth on how to, you know, be able to provide um, acceptance and support. I mean, there's a difference between acceptance and support. So um, I can accept who you are, but then there's limitations to that. Um, if a parent is supportive, then then they're they're full on supportive as far as like you know allowing the child to express who they are, their gender identity or their sexual identity. So so research research has found that par for parents and caregivers to talk to their children about their identity. Uh, the coming, the 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 disclosure, the coming out process is not just a one-time conversation. This is this is an ongoing conversation. So it's going to be important for for um, you know be able to educate parents about okay, this is you know we need to continue having this conversation in order for a child to feel more supported and accepted. Um, express you know for parents to be able to express affection during uh, disclosure. A lot of times there's shock. There's uh, there's sadness. Parents may become hysterical, but be able to ex you know be able to express their affection. I I love you. I'm I'm so I'm, I'm going to be here for you no matter what, and also be able to provide support. Um, and also advocate for their child if they're being mistreated. So and and advocating for them is not just. Um, you know, within families, but within the community, the schools, and so forth. So, if if a child is experiencing any type of bullying because, um, you know, uh, because of their gender or their sexual identity expression, then then it's going to be important for for parents to be uh, vocally active in, in with their within the schools and and other and, and other communities. And also require other family members to respect their LGBT child. So, if if in a household mom is accepting and supportive, but dad is not, and he's still struggling with it, then it's going to be important for for parents to be on the same page as far as like, okay, you you know, for that supportive parent to be able to say, listen, you know, be able to talk to the other parent and set some some boundaries there. Any questions so far from the audience? Okay, so we do have one question. Um, were the community agencies LGBT focused? That's a great question. Um, uh, there's been a lot of work, um, at least within the South Florida community, to be uh, for community agencies to be more mindful, uh, to be sensitive. Um, uh, to all to all um, people being served. I know here at Christie House, we um, we have you know the safe space um, uh, signage in in our reception area and our intake questionnaires uh, focus on you know asking questions about gender and 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 sexual and sexuality. So um, our at least within our agency, we've been able to accommodate um, to. Um, to be culturally sensitive to one's uh, gender and sexual identity here. Um, and that's taken time. That's taken time um, for that, uh, for those changes to, to take place. So part of advocacy, you know, within your um, community mental health settings is to be able to promote an inclusive practice and, and, be, and it starts from the greeting area, um, you know, be able to have it, uh, signs and indicators that this is a safe uh, space for LGBT youth and people, and um, and 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 that takes time, and you know, and and so forth. But definitely, uh, at least within our agency, we've been very, very active in that sense. Any other questions? Yeah, we just had several more come in. Um, we have a question from Angela who asks, "Do you recommend any books or articles for parents?" Uh, at this time, yet yeah, uh, yes, they can they can go to um, the GLAD website and and also there's um, there's resources for PFLAG, which is um, um, for the organization for parents who whose youth come out as LGBT. 
uh, they can look into um, support groups. Um, I know here in the South Florida community, there's um, uh, there's community agencies that 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 work with parents um, when their youth has come out as as um, LGBT um, uh, as LGBT. Um, as far as books are concerned, there is a book that I want to recommend for for mental health professionals and working with families. Um, it's called. Um, it was published by the by the American Counseling Association uh, a few years ago, um, called Affirm Affirmative Counseling with LGBTQI People. So I'm I'm going to put the book up here on the screen. If you want to take a look at it, okay. So you would just have to go to the American Counseling Association uh, website under resources, and you'll find a ton of resources there. All right. Um, we also, the next question is from Denny, who asks, how do you offset a negative reaction from the parents in a session um, without appearing to take sides? Very good question. Um, and that, yeah, that can result in um, counter transference issues. <laughs> so I, I think supervision is one of the key factors in 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 dealing with those internal issues that the the counselor the therapist um, has to you know process before uh, working with such parents. Um, I and and thankfully I mean well I had one situation years ago where uh, the parental reaction was uh, was negative and I had to de-escalate the situation as my client had walked out of the office. Um, for some time, so I had to de-escalate the situation in that sense, and and eventually reintegrate her back in the session. Um, but other, um, as far as like one's internal process, um, you really have to put yourself in check because at the end of the day, this is their their own experience, and this is what their belief system is, and there's no way we can. As mental health professionals, we can change that. So, so it's really, you know, seeking supervision, you know, uh, your peers, if you're licensed, and and be able to really, um, you know, see, you know, find something like to like about the individual in order for you to have that empathy. Because even if you don't agree with their their opinions, um, that's how they were raised. So. Denny adds, not so much about counter-transference issues, but wanting both parts to be able to be heard. Yes, yes. And I'm going to talk about uh, treatment interventions um, and shortly, so um, we'll, we'll be getting to that. Now, Angela has a question in a comment. She says, can you show a picture of the safe space? And she adds, I work in a school and I recommended having safe space signs and it was suggested we don't do that. A student should feel safe all the time to be who they are. I challenge that it's not the case, but it was shot down. Mm. No, no, that that is unfortunate because um, youth, particularly LGBT youth, they they need to find something in their environment to be able to indicate that it's OK um, to talk. Um, in my office, I'll, I have this little um, plush animal, and I'm going to show it on the screen. Um, and I have it right in front of me, and it has the, the button with the equality um, um, sign on it. And, and, that's, uh, and that becomes an indicator um, for, for the youth to feel comfortable if they're, if they're able, if they're, you know, they're questioning their sexuality or if they already know who they are, they can they can disclose to to me. Um, I presented at other conferences and um, I'll have my my equality sticker uh, hanging on my on my bulletin board behind my desk. And um, and, the, and they, that's something that they can see right away. So if, if they're if that's how they identify, then pro like in the first couple of sessions, they'll They'll, they'll disclose to me. All right, and that is it for the questions for now. Okay, All right. So again, as far as like what can parents and caregivers do as, as far as providing support, um, being able to take um, your child to LGBT events, like it, um, you know, whether it's the pride parade or, or an event that, that's catered to youth, 
um, that, 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 that would be able to demonstrate that you are being supportive of them. Um, be able to provide their child with LGBT mentors. So, so this is this one's really important. So, if there's a family member who who identifies um, as LGBT and they've done really well for themselves and, and in the community and so forth, be able to, you know, connect connect their youth to that family member. Or if there's somebody that, that you know in the community that's that's uh, influential or has have you know has been a uh, an advocate of, of, of the population that in, it's, it's important to introduce people in the in their youth's life that would be able to give them the the proper guidance and support. Also, be able to work with faith-based organizations that would be supportive of their of their youth. Um, you know, there are faith-based organizations that that are open to everyone, including the LGBT community. So being able to connect with those organizations because faith does is an important part of, uh, of a person's life, uh, for at least for more for, for for many people. So if if you're a youth who's connected to their faith and 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 you come out as LGBT, then being able to link the youth to faith-based organizations that are LGBT friendly is going to be very important for them as well. Also, welcome friends and partners of of, of their youth in the home. Um, a lot of times, uh, you know, parents who are not very who are not supportive, uh, they may be accepting but not necessarily supportive. And we're like, well, you know, I, I love you. you this is who you, who you are, but you just can't bring anyone home. Uh, I had, you know. Uh, I worked with a family uh, years ago that um, the youth identified as as bisexual and and the mom was very you know adamant like well you know if if you're if if she's gonna bring a, a female home that I'm not I'm not gonna be accepting of that so again that brings a a, a strain in the parent-child relationship so for a parent to be fully supportive it's gonna be important for them to be able to welcome their friends and, and, and partners into their home. And also be supportive of their child's gender expression and believe that their child can have a happy future as an LGBT adult. Um, uh, there was a comment earlier of, of parental fears of societal pressures and backlash and so forth. And, and for many parents and caregivers, they want the best for their, for their, for their child. So, um, you know, you know, the, a lot of the fears that they may have is, um, you know, I don't want my child to be discriminated. I don't want my child to be targeted. I don't want my child to feel bad. So, you know, let's, you know, I, I accept you, but you just can't be flamboyant about it or, or put yourself out there like that because it's just not okay. You're going to be targeted. And, and at the end of the day, to be able to provide support as a whole is accept every part of, of who they are. Okay, so now we come to treatment approaches. So I know the the question in the one of the questions in the audience was, okay, so how do we work with these parents, right? So um, before we get to that, um, if anyone is involved in working with trauma, the the National Child Traumatic um, um, Child uh, Traumatic Stress Network, um, uh, you can look them up online. They have a, a ton of resources in, in working with LGBT youth that have experienced some sort of trauma. And it doesn't necessarily have to be any type of child abuse, but even just the process of coming out can be traumatic for a lot of youth. So um, I, I, I included the link for your handouts. Um, it's a 20 minute video that it's, it's very comprehensive in the sense like there's youth that are being interviewed and um, professionals that are interviewed and, and they talk about, you know, how, how to be able to, um, you know, work and as far as like working with youth and, and be able to provide support. So that's something for, um, for you to look at at your leisure. But as far as treatment approaches, um, uh, you know, basically we, we have to go back to basics. I mean, as, as counselors and therapists, um, there are some key competencies when working with LGBTQ clients, right? Um, as a professional, don't don't make assumptions, right? Just don't just because the client identifies as LGBTQ doesn't mean that 
they're coming in to see you um, because of their sexuality or their gender identity. They may, you know, if it's an adult client, they may, and that's not the issue, they, they may come in for other issues, but don't make assumptions when they come in for treatment that it's, it's about their, their gender identity or their sexual identity. Um, be able to understand the terminology. Um, this, this is constantly changing. Terminology is constantly changing, especially um, with, a, with the transgender population, the LGBT, uh, other sectors of the, of the population. Ter terminology is constantly changing. So counselors have to be up to date with the terminology. Um, and also understanding mental health and, and addiction related uh, factors. Uh, when it comes to um, working with LGBTQ clients. Um, it's, you know, a lot of times um, they may experience, you know, the mental health aspects of it, but their way of coping may be through drugs and alcohol. So it's going to be very, very important to be able to have an understanding of that. And also be able to promote uh, resiliency that, you know, in, when working uh, with these clients is, you know, they've been able to overcome so much and, and that they're coming to you for, for assistance is, it really shows a sign of, 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 of strength that, that they, you know, they want to succeed and they want to be better and they want to, you know, they don't want to feel depressed anymore or bad anymore. So, and also be able to create a safe space. Like we, we talked about earlier, you know, it could be the signage, it could be, you know, a picture, it could be, it could be anything that may pr promote a safe place for, uh, for, for the client to be able to disclose. Okay. And know and, and to refer to appropriate resources. If, if you're, you're competent in working with this area, but uh, the client, the, the client, you know, struggles with other areas that you don't feel confident in working in, then it's going to be in, important to refer them um, to other resources. If, like with LGBT clients, if you think that they would benefit um, in participating in group treatment, uh, in addition to in, individual family therapy with you, then um, it's it's going to be important to link them to those resources in, in the community. They may need, you know, be able to. Uh, they may want to attend support groups or if they have issues with substance use and that's not your area of expertise, be able to refer to them, uh, refer appropriately. And also commit to ongoing learning, just like you're here today, you know, dedicating uh, two hours of your time to learn more about this population. You're, you're, you constantly have to be um, researching and, and learning and how to, you know, be uh, a better mental health professional when it comes to working with this population. Oh, okay. Any questions so far from what we've talked about? All right, we do have um, a at least a comment to sharing of resources. Sally says some other sources or groups such as the one that a friend of mine is in, she's in a group as a mother of LGBTQ youth called Mama Bears. It's a movement growing among the mothers of LGBTQ plus kids from churches that make their lives miserable. They mm -hmm. call themselves Mama Bears and they belong to a secret FB community. There is also a blog called Serendipity Duda for moms of LGBTQ. Okay, Serendipity Duda. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing, Sally. Okay, so, so the treatment approaches that have been effective in working uh, with uh, this population uh, has been structural family therapy and also attachment-based family therapy, um, which um, attachment-based family therapy is derived from, from structural family therapy. Uh, and, and they promote, um, be able to enhance communication uh, within, within family members between the youth and, and the caregivers in particular. Um, and from what you see on the screen, uh, you know, uh, the interventions such as the enactments and reframing techniques that the mental health professional can use with, with working with these families um, has proven to be effective because it can assist the youth and, 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 and caregivers to reduce emotional reactivity and promote healthier communication on the topic. Um, and also with attachment-based family therapy, 
Uh, I'm not, this is not an area that I practice, but it's, it's a structured type of treatment. Um, it's anywhere from 12 to 16 sessions uh, where it can help uh, promote parent-child attachment and it helps promote autonomy and competent, competence with the youth. Um, so, and yes, I mean, and I hope it answers your question as far as like, um, dealing with with difficult difficult parents because like again and and i i believe that structural family therapy would be effective especially in working with with challenging parents that really are firm in their in their beliefs because then it can help promote um that not just one voice being heard but both voices being heard and the facilitator um doesn't appear in a way that can be partial to one party or another Again, going back, um, uh, as far as treatment approaches when it comes to trans youth, uh, Reed Vanderberg has been one of the uh, leading researchers when it comes to working with this part, this uh, segment of the um, of the LGBT population, and he has done extensive work um, with transgender children and their families. Um, a lot of times, um, parents may ask questions during the initial phases in treatment. They may question whether their child may be experiencing some sort of mental illness. Um, he's found that parents um, may be unsure of the actions they should take be, uh, regarding their child. Um, they may be, you know, going to you to to seek to seek resources and information in order to understand their child's identity. So they, it, you know, they come in asking a lot, a ton of questions, um, and and he's seen that parents. Um, uh, the, you know, uh, promote advocacy and advice on social ramifications of their child actualizing a new gender role at school or in their extracurricular activities. So he really reinforces the fact that parents um, with trans children, they're going to have to really be able to advocate for their uh, for their child, especially in, in uh, within the school setting. So it means, you know, having to talk to teachers, being able to talk to administrators, being able to help um, their child create a, a safe space um, uh, in the school environment. And also, he, he advised it's important for them to be, to, for parents to seek professional support whenever, you know, um, they experience their child experiencing, you know, when, you know, their child is questioning their, their gender identity and so forth. He also suggested to conduct a family assessment when initiating treatment with this fa these families um, to be able to assess the family structure for any type of dysfunctionality, um, to be able to um, identify in any type of emergence process. And as far as like working with uh, functional families, um, he talks about how um, uh, they, that parents have to observe their, their child's day-to-day -day behaviors and and that parents shouldn't try to mold their children and parents should put their child's well-being above all else and that parents are willing to work with a child's school and advocate for their child so that you know his findings you know did look, did promote what what he talked about as far as like doing advocacy work um, and promoting you know be able to create a safe environment for their for their children not just in the home but in in the school settings as well So in conclusion, um, family support and acceptance is an intrinsic part of, uh, of a youth's development. Um, caregivers must be supportive in order for LGBTQ youth to thrive. Um, acceptance promotes a healthy sense of self-worth, uh, reduces the risk for depression, suicide, um, su substance abuse, child abuse, and other, and other risky behaviors. Um, so I want to leave uh, the rest of the time of what we have left in our in our webinar to, um, you know, have, you know, if, if uh, you know, participants have any final thoughts, any questions, anything more they want would like to know about. Uh, 
All right, and participants, in addition to entering questions or comments into the questions box for discussion, if you prefer, we can also use the option of unmuting you and allowing you to speak directly, especially if you have a, a maybe a more lengthy thing to discuss or questions that are hard to clarify through text. So if you'd like to be unmuted, you can just enter that into the questions box instead and say that you know, um, you'd like to talk directly or you'd like to be unmuted and we'll be glad to do that for you. While the questions are coming in here, I already see a couple um, questions and comments. Uh, Lindsay says, thank you so much for all of the information and I really appreciate it. And uh, Denny would like to be unmuted. So I'm going to go ahead, Denny, and unmute you. Um, so I have just done that. Okay. Um, okay. Yes, we can. Okay, I, I've been um, working with um, uh, gay and lesbian youth for quite some time. Transgender's the new one, and that's uh, you know coming into my office. And the the play, the area that I'm feeling um, like I'm not connected well enough are uh, transgender therapists that are. Um, stating or telling me that they have resources about hormone treatments and stuff like that and I end up referring them okay um, because I want them to have a full spectrum of services uh, a full spectrum of information that I may not have mm -hmm. um, do you uh, do you find that should be integrated in a, a role of a therapist who say they specialize with transgender or Definitely, at least have have knowledge of of that process on its own. Um, I know that um, I I worked in in um, one of the leading um, nonprofits in South Florida um, as part of my PhD program, and I worked with um, trans youth and and adults and and um, I. Actually, you know, I was in your position as well, like, okay, what do I do as far as like link, linking them to resources? But one of the things I was, um, and because I have my license, I, I would have to do thorough assessments with them as, as far as like them being capable of starting hormone therapy or going through the gender reassignment process. So it's important to be able to be knowledgeable of who, uh, as a as a mental health professional, being able to link your clients to the yeah. uh, to the proper uh, resources. Um, I was able to learn a lot about um, you know the resources in my community as far as like okay what doctors they they need to go to as far as like um, getting evaluated for hormone hormone therapy and and gender reassignment uh, as far as like community um, uh, health. Uh, you know, if they're not able to pay out of pocket or they're not able to pay a lot out of pocket for um, for for such treatments. So where, it's where do you, get you don't to have to be an expert, but you have to be knowledgeable. Sure. Where 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 could I access these type of assessments? And uh, I'm just curious of how to better ask, uh, do the assessment process in this well, particular area. Yeah, I um I don't um I don't know where you're at. Um, Per se, but West mm -hmm. you're at West Palm Beach. Uh huh. Oh, okay, so um, SunSurf, um, uh, you know, a uh, SunSurf in Fort Lauderdale. Yes. Yeah. Yes, they do. They do the assessments um, uh, for for um, for the uh, transgender community, um, and you. I mean, you can go into their website and and link yourself to them, and they'll be more than happy to help you as far Thank as. You. Like, you're welcome. If attendees are interested, I could also um, offer that, and maybe we could do this in a follow-up email for those who complete the survey, but there is a guideline that is published called the Standards of Care for the Health of Transsexual, Transgender, and Gender Nonconforming People. It's yeah. published by the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and it has some great resources for the mental health professionals working with transgender clients in terms of our role um, in, in transition processes, for example. Um, I also have an example of things that surgeons want from in a letter from a mental health professional working with a client um, before any type of surgical intervention, like a top surgery, for example, um, and some, uh, some additional resources that might be helpful. Thank you. 
Yes, you're, you're right. And, 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 and as, as part of being a mental health professional, when doing these assessments with your clients, it's going to be very important to integrate the psychoeducational piece as well, because, um, you know, some doctors may follow the guidelines, um, but others may, may require more from, from the mental health professionals. I, I, had, um, I had a client that, um, uh, whose doctor required two letters of recommendation. And, and the standard right now is, is one, one letter of recommendation from a, mental, a licensed mental health professional um, to be able to assess and, and authorize for, um, for gender reassignment and hormone treatment. So uh, as an agency, uh, we had to advocate for that and the doctor was still insistent on that. So also being able to, to uh, link our clients to the appropriate medical professionals. Could you uh, could you maybe talk a little bit about um, now you you work with clients when they're when they are transitioning correct Julie Yes. Would you be able to talk a little bit about um, sort of like maybe the bullet point version in the sense of what you see as being the different things that a, that a mental health counselor might be focusing on with a client um, to help them to prepare for transition. Yes. Uh, would that be okay I, with you? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Um, it's definitely important to be able to educate your clients of what the the physical changes, the physical aspects of the changes that they're going to experience, uh, the hormonal changes that they're going to experience, even the emotional aspects of it. Um, with one trans client that I worked with, it, uh, I, I helped her, um, you know, address, you know, her her disclosure process with with her family and her friends and, 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 and be able to help her understand that this is how, how you're feeling now. And then you're, you're in a very different place in your life than what um, your family members are at. So it's going to be important to um, be able to validate where they're at when, when um, you just disclose, but also I helped her understand this is, this is what's going to happen. These are the steps and, you know, you know, three months from now, you may not look the same way as you do now, and you may you may encounter um, changes in, in your environment as well, not just with your uh, with your friends and your family, but also in your professional work environment. So that that in itself, it's you know, when they say disclosing, disclosing, it it takes it, it's a process. It takes a while, and and even with the transgender population, it's even more so because. Um, once they start hor hormone treatment, their physical appearance is going to change as time goes on, and it's going to and it's helping them have the the tools that they need to be able to cope with the changes around them, not just internally but externally as well. Thank you. I did, by the way, I posted in the questions box for everybody to see the link to download those um, treatment recommendations from WPATH. Yes. Um, I'll say, you know, I, I do a pretty good amount of work with clients who are transitioning, and I really like to focus on ensuring that they are building an adequate support system, mm -hmm. um, that they understand the potential, uh, both have a great understanding of the benefits and drawbacks of the transition, anticipating challenges, and having a sense of resources or a plan on how to address things. And that can even include things like being misgendered by somebody or when somebody mm -hmm. uses a dead name or how to get um, gender markers changed in various mm -hmm. documents, all of that sort of a part of the process. And um, I I've noticed that surgeons, a lot of times what they like to see is they want to know, are there other co-occurring mental disorders mm -hmm. that, um, and if so, are they being adequately addressed um, so that the person sort of has adequate coping strategies in place that they're using and that they could tolerate any extra stress that might come from the transition process without it exacerbating another condition. And um, they'll also often want, of course, to see confirmation of the gender dysphoria diagnosis and to know that this that this is well established. This isn't somebody who's in a temporary state of confusion or ambivalence about um, their gender. They, they want to know this is well established, well documented. Mm -hmm. um, that seems to be a part of, um, and that the person's making a good informed choice, that they're of sound mind and, and they're reasoning appropriately and, and some of those things 
they seem to want to see as well. We have several other comments and, and ideas. Um, first of all, Robert says, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Roxana adds, I'm a board certified transgender care therapist and would love to work with anyone who is interested. And this has me curious about um, what kinds of credentials or certification processes or more formal or structured training options might be out there for okay. counselors who are interested. Obviously, Roxana knows about um, such a board certification. I'm wondering who provides that certification. Yes, I'd be curious to know as well. <laughs> yeah. So maybe Roxana, if you'd like to either type something in about that or perhaps even be unmuted. And uh, while we're waiting on that, Sally says, I would definitely be interested in the follow-up email with those resources. So we'll try to include some of that information as well. Mm -hmm. And for right now, anyway, that's all of the questions. Oh, here we go. So Roxana would like to be unmuted. So Roxana, I'm gonna go into the system here and uh, see if I can go ahead and unmute you. And you should now be unmuted. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, how are you? Hello. Good. How about Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, so I got my training by the International Institute of Clinical Sexology. And it was pretty good. It covered all the all the stuff. Um, and it is, you know, once you get this training, you realize the extent of how much you have to be involved, not only as a therapist, but as an educator. Um, and like you had mentioned, you know, being able to connect to resources, like the legal aspect of things um, with the surgeons, with the endocrinologist. Um, there's a lot of case management that goes into it. Yes. Um, so it's very important that they have the correct um, referral sources um, and not just like LGBT friendly. I believe yeah. that you could be affirming and obviously you can help them, but you need to know at what point you need to refer out to. Definitely. I 100% agree with uh, with your statement. So that I mean, you can provide the safe space, the environment, but also be knowledgeable. That's part of the competencies um, when working with with LGBT clients. Thank you. You're welcome. I am also. I found uh, previously a really good um, resource from Equality Florida that provides all of the ins and outs about what to do about the driver's license, um, gender marker, how to get an official name change, what about social security card. They really like walk clients through the entire process. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and post the link to that guideline in, uh, or to that resource specific to Florida um, in the, uh, in the uh, questions box as well here in just a moment. Um, and then we also have some other questions. Uh, Carrie says, do you have any resources for learning more about structural family therapy? Yes, I can, def um, I mean, definitely uh, be able to, um, uh, if, you're, if your focus is not family systems, then um, being able to uh, do a little, do more research on what is structural family therapy. Um, I can forward you some, some resources if you can provide an email. All right, and the next, um, a couple other people saying yes, they'd also love to get some emails here. Okay. Oh, and then there's the question, can we get a copy of today's slides? So just a reminder in case anybody missed it before, at your GoToWebinar control panel, you'll see an option that says handouts and there's a triangle on the left side of that option. If you click on that triangle, you should see an, a PDF file that starts off with LGBTQ youth. Um, you can click on that and that should allow you to download the PDF for today's slides. Now, let me see, I think we have a couple more questions coming in here. All right, Carrie says thanks and has shared an email address. Okay. Um, what we could do to make things easier also, Julie, is any any of those resources, you could just send them to me and I'll make sure that in a follow-up email, we get them to every one of the uh, attendees. So that way we can get them all in one, one email if you'd like. Perfect, yeah, we will do. 
And then Roxanne has asked, Julie, can you send your contact information? Yes, it's actually one of my slides. It's towards the end. So there All you right. go. So so if people download the uh, slides, yeah. then they should be all set. Okay. Yeah, so I have two contact, um, the, um, my contact information for Christy House, that's my day job. And then for the private practice, um, I did include my cell phone number and my, and my email. So uh, yeah, I look forward to hearing from you and, and be able to link and, and be able to uh, exchange information. So I did just post the link to the to the information on helping clients with gender marker changes on everything from birth certificate to driver's license name changes um, with of course all that information from Equality Florida. Mm -hmm. And folks, there is still time if you have a question or you want to discuss something. So feel free to input that in the questions box. But while we're waiting to see if there are any additional items, I can go ahead and provide a, a couple of reminders and a few important announcements. Um, the first is that a reminder that at the end of today's webinar, you're going to see a webinar evaluation form populate on your screen. It's very important you complete those questions. It's not only great feedback to the presenter today and to FAMCA, but it's also mandatory if you want CEs for attending today and you'll want to complete that evaluation form today. So if you miss it when it populates on your screen at the end of the webinar, you will get a follow-up email at about 5 p.m. Eastern time that will include a link to that survey. Just make sure that you do it tonight so we can enter your CE broker attendance in um, very rapidly here as, as we're required to do. And again, we are gonna have a video recording available if you need to refresh your memory on a few things. Um, as far as announcements go, our next webinar is, um, I'm very excited about, I'm pretty, pretty excited about all of our webinars though, so um, it's entitled To D or Not To D, Differentiating Between Post-Traumatic Stress and Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder with Dr. David Sanfilippo. It's on Friday, September 27th from 2 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. To reg register, you can visit fomca.org, fmhca.org. Um, another thing is that we currently have proposals out for webinar presenters, and we have so many wonderful members here in Fonca that um, here in Florida that have um, expertise and have passion and excitement about the areas of our field that are very important to them and great information that we can all benefit from. So I would encourage you to consider submitting a proposal for our 2020 webinar series and uh, or um, pass along the call for proposals to colleagues that you know who you think would have something really good to present to us that we'd all benefit from. Um, so to access information on um, presenting, you would go to our website, which is FOMCA org and um, you would also then click on if you hover your mouse over webinar series you'll see call for webinars um, and if you click on that then um, you will be redirected to a place where you can actually submit um, your proposal for a webinar it's a great uh, resume enhancer it's a great way to establish yourself as an expert but also a great way to spread the information that you're so passionate about. And Julie, if you don't mind me saying, this was your first time presenting for a webinar, right? Yes, yes. And I, I experienced a great deal of stress right before then. <laughs> yes. So the reason I put you on the spot like that is, I know the first time I presented a webinar, I was so nervous in great part because, and I didn't even have a, a much of a help from a moderator or anything. Mm -hmm. So I was just, uh, the fact that I couldn't see or hear people was mm -hmm. very intimidating to me. I couldn't get those cues that you usually get from when you're presenting in person with people to kind of know how people are responding to things. Yes. But um, let me ask you, was it was it uh, an okay experience for you for a first time? I, I guess after after the first half hour, I started feeling more com comfortable. Yeah. Um, I'm used to doing presentations in the community and around the state and, and I teach. So, so I'm, I'm, I tend to be very in tune with my audience and be very interactive. So this is a different form for me and I actually enjoyed it. 
Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed it. I, yeah. I usually hear from people, they're pretty nervous the first time they present, but they're really glad that they did it and usually have a pretty good experience with it. So I say that because if there are any of you out there that you've got great information to share, but you're maybe a little nervous about presenting, understand that is normal. It's okay. That's the way it is for all of us. And, um, and hopefully we'll get you through it um, painlessly and maybe you'll even end up enjoying it and deciding that you're ready to do more webinars in the future. So one final um, announcement is uh, that is FOMCA related. Um, unfortunately, I kind of forgot what that final announcement was. Wow, it came in and out really quickly here. Um, I can tell you we're we're um, getting already getting registrations for the upcoming annual conference. Um, but I I know there was one other thing that would have been good for me to share with you, but I lost it and forgot to write it down. So oh well, maybe we'll announce it next time. Okay, I don't think I see any other questions in the box right now, so I so I believe this would be a good time then for us to conclude things for today. So I want to say that we wish you all a very um, happy and fulfilling weekend. We want to thank you, Julie, for a wonderful presentation and a very informative and engaging one. Thank and, you. So much. Uh, thank you. So the survey will be up in a moment. Any, any parting words before we wrap things up, oh, Julie? Um, no, I, I mean, I look forward to hearing back from all of you. Um, I think this is a great way to be able to connect with other um, professionals in, in the South Florida community. And um, I'll definitely be in touch with some of you. So, um, and, I, and I hope to be able to present in the future. All right, wonderful. Then we'll wish you all a wonderful weekend and we will see you next time.